about this when you said that you were going to open up with a big joke, and then all you did was introduce me. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, let me open with a scripture passage. I'm not going to preach on this or expound it at all, but let's just remember um, who we are and who Jesus is and where he is and how the church is situated uh, in creation. This is from Ephesians. Um, Ephesians 1, and um, here in verse 19, we're supposed to reflect on the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Thus far, God's word. Let's, let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would now be with me as I deal with this uh, very large and, and complicated topic of the mission of your church. Um, there are many ways in which I could err um, through imbalance or through um, forgetting one aspect or another of your people, your church, organized as your body, the body of Christ. Um, help me to, be, uh, to stay the course and be faithful to your word. Help your people here as they listen to learn and to be encouraged about what you are doing, what you, would, what you plan to do for the world through the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Oh, good. Okay. So, first one, yes. And nice beard. <laughs> Okay. Got a couple other handouts here, but we'll, I'll get to those later. Okay, get to those later. So, for about a year or so, actually a year or so formally, but maybe for three years or so, I've been thinking about redoing, reframing um, our church's mission. I think Remy, where's Remy? Where'd he go? I think you actually heard me talk about this at the Biblical Horizons conference, so uh, if you get up and leave, I'll understand. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say the exact same thing, but a lot of, a lot of the same things. Um, and how we might better express who we are, be more biblical in the way we um, approach being the church, in, at least in St. Louis and in the world. You know, this has become a pressing problem, I think, especially in the last couple of years. Um, more and more the church feels like, uh, and rightly, feels despondent, discouraged, marginalized. Um, I, I have people in my congregation going through a range of emotions with regard to the recent Supreme Court ruling, with regard to just the way Christians and the Christian faith and the Christian church is mischaracterized by the media and all sorts of things. So, and people want, people want there to be change. People want to change the world. How do we do that? How, 
And how is the church called to change the world? Um, some of you may have read in 2010, there was a book published by James uh, Davison Hunter. And the title was To Change the World. This book was actually pretty popular among evangelical scholars. It never quite made it uh, in terms of being a, a popular book that lots of kind of lay evangelicals bought. But a lot of pastors, a lot of seminary professors bought this book and took it to heart. And what Hunter does in this book, by the way, Hunter had been studying these things for a couple of decades. Uh, I think his first book in 1988 was Evangelicalism and the Coming Generation. So he's kind of always writing about these, uh, this clash between evangelicalism and culture, and American culture. In uh, the early 1990s, like 1991, he published a book that some of you probably have maybe heard of or even read called Culture Wars. Uh, and he was the one who kind of pop popularized and then put some content to this idea of the, the culture wars between evangelicals and, um, and the rest of American culture. But anyway, in 2010, this book, To Change the World, and what Hunter did was he challenged some of the popular ways that evangelicals think about how we change the world. And I don't want to go into all of his uh, criticisms, but one of them was this idea that somehow if we just teach everybody to adopt intellectually a biblical worldview, and the more people we can get to adopt a biblical worldview through teaching, through videos, through lectures, through studies, then slowly that will just kind of percolate through American culture. And in a grassroots kind of way, eventually, eventually change will happen at the top. Well, Hunter criticized that and has some pretty sharp and, I believe, cogent criticisms of that way of thinking. Um, and what he did, he proposed an alternate way of the church changing the world. Um, and I don't want to, again, I don't want to go into detail. I, just, I list that because, I list him, I, I reference him because a lot of evangelicals in my circles and Presbyterian circles and PCA circles, a lot of pastors have adopted kind of his way of thinking about things. His his key text was Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7, seek the peace of the city. Um, and it, it, what he calls faithful presence in the world. The church has to have a faithful presence uh, and a faithful presence in whatever vocation or community of people you find yourself, especially if you're a leader. And you should seek the peace, shalom, in the fullest sense of the word. I'm going to come back to that a little bit and and offer just a, a few challenges to that because I think the way that's been taken by a lot of pastors is um, not really very helpful. Helpful on some levels, but help, uh, not on other levels. So, um, so, so there you have it. I mean, people in my congregation are, are wondering what's going on, what are we supposed to do, what's the church supposed to do, what's a local church supposed to do, and so I've been thinking about this. We've been thinking about this. Uh, how, do we, how do we focus our energy so that we indeed can change the world um, and bring in the kingdom of God? Always remember the kingdom of God, we bring in, I mean, expand the kingdom of God. Always remember that the kingdom of God is not just heaven, not just individual salvation for people. When Jesus preached the kingdom of God, he was talking about social reality. He was talking about God's new way of organizing humanity under the lordship of Jesus. And that, that it's not just going to heaven when you die, although it is that, and that's very important. It's more than that. It's organizing all of human life in a new and different way. I'll actually have more to say about that in, my, in the evening sermon on Sunday. More to say about uh, the old way of organizing human life and the new way of organizing human life, especially as regard to love. But... I'll save that. So, so I'm pondering, I've been pondering, proposing uh, this new mission statement for our church. It's gone through a number of iterations now. I've passed it on to different people, and I'm going to show it to you a little later as we 
develop this uh, through the series. Um, but it's been a lot more difficult than I imagined. And for a number of reasons, let me give you some of the difficulties. First of all, trying to reduce the mission of the church, of any church, to a few lines or even a few paragraphs, that can be a dangerous thing, okay? Um, I have an entire bookshelf, and so does Steve, I'm sure, dedicated to the church, doctrine of church, ecclesiology, from all sorts of ecclesiastical traditions. And the Catholics define, they define their mission one way, and the Lutherans have their own take, and the Anglicans do their own thing, and the independents, and not all of it is wrong. It can, it can be also often be quite helpful to step outside of your own tradition and to look around and see what might be helpful from other, what they've seen that we've missed. Okay. And, um, but defining a church in, in, in very short, pithy kinds of uh, ways may be good marketing, and it's the way businesses often do things, but it doesn't always capture the fullness of what the church is called to do in the world. So the scriptures, just think about this for a minute. The scriptures describe the church as an assembly, which is pretty close to what the word church means. A body, okay, body of Christ. A temple, a house, a household, the household of God. A pillar, a family, a brotherhood, a priesthood, a kingdom, the new Israel, the new Jerusalem, a city, or just the people of God, or the communion of saints, or, or more. So which of these are we going to use, which of these are we going to ignore <laughs> when we write a mission or a purpose statement for the church. All of them envision something just a little bit different, not incompatible, but different. And there's no denying that we would lose a great deal if we reduced the church to one image or metaphor. I have a book by Avery Dulles, which is called The Models of the Church, and Dulles is a Roman Catholic. And he has something fairly interesting to say at the beginning of his uh, uh, book in, inter in introducing the subject. He, he has picked out five major approaches or types or what he calls models. And each of these models, he says, is considered and evaluated in itself. And as a result of the critical assessment, I draw the conclusion that a balanced theology of the church must find a way of incorporating the major affirmations of each basic ecclesiological type. Each of the models calls attention to certain aspects of the church that are less clearly brought out by other models. Okay. And I'm selecting the term models rather than aspects or dimensions because I wish to indicate my conviction that the church, like other theological realities, is a mystery. It, it is helpful as we go through this to remember there's a, very, there's a mystical dimension to the church, uh, something that defies definition and, and statements of purpose and mission. There's this mystical union between Jesus and his body. There's this power that we have that can't always be lined out or put on a spreadsheet or on a mission statement. It's important to remember that. Um, so there's this danger of reductionism uh, in formulating mission statements. Secondly, another reason it's difficult is our temptation to define our church in distinction from other churches. We love to define our church in distinction from all the other churches. So I've collected and listened to some sermons and lectures and from other pastors, and I've collected a bunch of mission statements from other churches, and I've noticed a disturbing tendency, especially in Reformed circles, and that is that you, we tempt the congregation to think that we are something special in our city. And we have something wonderful to offer that other churches don't offer. And you'll read things or you hear things in sermons like, what this city needs is a church that fill in the blanks. Because we don't have a church like that in the city. Or you'll hear things like, this city doesn't need another church that, 
dot, dot, dot. We have too many of them already. Okay. Now, you don't want the end result of a mission statement to be arrogance vis-a-vis -vis other churches in your community. You really don't want that. It's really hard to pull off comparing yourself to other churches without encouraging a hubris, a kind of arrogance and pride that always comes naturally to us. Ecclesiastical hubris also comes naturally. Okay. Well, having said that, though, however, recognizing one's strengths and gifts does not need to lead to sinful pride, but can be a realistic appraisal of what God has given to any particular body. So it is, it is true that we in the Reformed tradition have a certain set of gifts that we offer to the church, just so long as we don't set it over against other churches and think that what we have is necessarily better than them. A lot of churches offer things uh, and serve people in ways that we don't, and that's okay. Thirdly, another difficulty, another temptation, and Steve and I were talking about this a little bit at dinner and that is the temptation to create the coolest, hippest, most awesomest mission statement that I can impress all my friends with. And generally speaking, the best way to do that is just pick one word. <laughs> journey. We are the journey or the, we, the, the excitement. Or what was the one we said? Encounter. The encounter. <laughs> or, I mean... There are all these kinds of things, you know. Okay, you can create a really sexy mission statement, and church planners love to do that. And you get a real postmodern name, you know, and, and then you can appeal to all the young urbanophiles, and, you, and, you know, then all of a sudden, it just gets kind of weird. Okay? It just gets kind of weird. Okay? Uh, now, I'm not saying that all those churches are as bad as they're, single word names, they're, they're generally not. Of course, they're churches of Jesus Christ and they have a ministry and a service, but you know, I just, just need to be careful of that. The fourth thing is, you know, everybody today starts off with what we're going to do, with a, a kind of pragmatic uh, approach to doing church, okay? We don't, we, we don't take the time often to just think about things. I don't, back in the 70s, College freshmen were surveyed, and they believed by a two-to-one majority that developing a meaningful philosophy of life in college was more important than getting ahead financially. Those actually are quotes from the survey that was taken. Getting, developing a meaningful philosophy of life as compared to getting ahead financially. That's in the 70s. A few decades later... The response from college freshmen to the same question was completely flipped. Two to one majority with the results reversed. Okay. Now it's getting ahead financially, which is, you think about it, all colleges and universities are moving from a liberal education, meaning of education that brings freedom, freedom of mind and thought and life, to vocational training. Okay. Making money, getting a good paying job, is much more important now. So you have a shift from philosophy, in the broad sense, to pragmatics. Okay, philosophy in the large sense, larger sense of love of wisdom, and a care about formulating one's own philosophy of life. Well, that just won't pay off. Okay, uh, when I was in school in the '70s, I was in uh, University of Missouri. Wow, what a mess that is. Um, <laughs> I'll refrain from saying anything about that. Uh, I was the, the liberal arts college in the University of Missouri was the largest college at, at Mizzou. By far, it had the most students. You know, we're talking about history, English, um, literature, all, all that. Now it's again, it's flipped. It's flip flop. I was talking to someone who's in the administration in one of the colleges in one of the universities in St. Louis, and he was telling me that everything now is going to vocational ministry. Everything. And there's hardly any place anymore for history and English and philosophy, not at all. Um, I was actually in the sciences. I was a geology major. And 
And I, I just remember everybody asking me, what are you in geology for, man? You know, you're going, to be, you're going to be working for these big oil companies making lots of money. You know? I'm like, well, actually, the reason I'm in geology is because I'm studying paleontology and earth history. And I really kind of just want to figure out what I believe about evolution and creation. And they're like, whoa, man, that's, that's really weird. <laughs> okay. Um, and the church... I think in the past three decades has been carried away by pragmatism, the pragmatism of the marketplace, and kind of lost her bearings in the world. Because now the, uh, the I'm trying to pick a word that doesn't, that works here. The most vibrant and, and uh, uh, I don't know, the, the church that flourishes, if you judge a church whether it's flourishing well, it's the most successful, it's the biggest, it's the richest, okay? Um, and those churches have learned how to tap into marketing in a way that makes their churches grow, okay? Um, they do almost everything and anything to attract people. I'm, I'm on the board of Westminster Christian Academy in St. Louis, which is a, uh, which is still a reformed Westminster Confession of Faith kind of founded school. It's, it's very large now, uh, but and I, as a board member, I interview families that come in uh, and apply for uh, enrollment. And one of our requirements is you have to be a professing Christian. At least one of the parents has to be a professing Christian and a regular attender at. at a, at some church. It doesn't have to be a reformed church, but a church. So I was interviewing these parents one time, and their daughter was there, and parents would go to one of these big mega kind of churches in St. Louis, and, and, um, and they were talking about how their daughter just loves the church and how great it is. And so I asked her, I don't remember her name, I said, what is it that you love about your church? Why, is it, why, is it, why are you on fire for your church? I just kind of wanted to hear what she said. And what she said was, the pastor is so cool. And I'm sitting there thinking, hey, I'm cool. <laughs> Pastor is so cool. I said, well, 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 a few weeks ago, he came riding into the auditorium on a motorcycle and rode up onto the, onto the stage and got off and gave his message. And then, and then she said, you know, a couple months ago, they had, they had rings of fire that people were jumping through up on the stage. It was so awesome. And then she said something else, and by that time I was like, oh my goodness. Uh, but poor little girl, how do you feed that? How do you continue to feed that? What's next? She, 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 scriptures are not read, Old Testament, New Testament, gospel readings in this church. Uh, that, you know, as, what, that's just crazy. Anyway. Um, and so um, we need a liberal what I'm saying I guess is we need a liberal education in ecclesiology we need to again rethink what the scriptures say about the church and our mission uh, before we start just getting pragmatic about what we're supposed to do okay? uh, I, have, I have seminary students not, not in my church my, my some of the students in my church don't do this, our interns. But I've had this happen at least twice on a committee of the Presbytery. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, chairing the committee, the examinations, the theological examinations committee. And I have a student, two students do this, talk to me beforehand. Hey, you know, I'm really nervous about this oral exam. They're going to ask me about Bible. They're going to ask me about theology. They're going to ask me about this. I said, yeah, yeah, you studied. You know, we've talked on the phone. I've helped you know what's going on here. And I said, oh, you know, would you just tell me what to say? I'm like, well, what do you mean? I said, when someone asks a question, can you just kind of tell me what the answer is and I'll agree with it? I'm like, well, I just want to get through this, you know. It's like, well, it, the whole point is so that we can know that you have these convictions and at least this basic knowledge. Yeah, but some of these controversies I don't really want to deal with. Just tell me what to say. It's like, 
very pragmatic. That's not helpful, you know. That's not good. <laughs> not good at all. Um, but for all those pitfalls, I mean, we, you know, all those pitfalls, all those difficulties in formulating a mission statement, all those challenges that we have today, is still something I think we all need to do. Uh, it's helpful for us periodically just to rethink what we are as a church, who we are, what's our calling, what's our duty, what's our task um, from the scriptures, and then, um, and then implement what God wants us to do. Now, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to suggest, or more than suggest, I'm going to call us to envision a church as having a priestly and a kingly and a prophetic calling. Okay, so we're going to think about the church in three dimensions, threefold calling of the church. A church is a royal priesthood. The church is also a company of prophets. And I want to summarize the church's mission in terms of these three biblical vocations or offices, priest, king, and prophet. Uh, now, I'll just say a few things about the background to this, in our circles, we've been working on this for decades. I mean, uh, Jim Jordan's book, Sociology of the Church, in 1986, um, his recorded lectures, his newsletters, there's just been this interest in our circles anywhere, way, on the church for, you know, 30 years. Um, and there are lots of books and lots of essays written on this. All the Biblical Horizons conferences on worship and Old Testament rituals and the sacrifices and the Trinity and the flow of biblical history uh, from priest, king to prophet um, and the connection of the three, these three human vocations with the persons of the Godhead. Um, we, there's a, been a lot of work. And what I guess I'm trying to do is kind of bring it all together uh, in, a, in a form that's helpful and that can be useful in guiding us um, as, as churches. I mean, you've got three synoptic gospels, which basically follow this pattern. Matthew Priestley, Mark Kingley, and Luke Prophetic. You have the book of Acts, which goes through a, a similar pattern. The first five chapters, Priestly mission of the church, then 6 through 12, in the land, a kingly mission. And then 13 through 28, Paul goes out to all the nations, and it's a very prophetic um, prophetic uh, uh, activity that he's engaged in. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about just what that means and, um, and why it's important. But before we get there, right away, I mean, there, there's some questions. Why these archaic antiquarian terms, priest, king, prophet. Indeed, it's, they're worse than old. They're suspect. In America, they're dirty words. King? No, no king. Priest? Whoa, especially in American Protestantism. We don't like priests. Prophet? Even that has um, a history, especially in the last 150 years, a uh, whole prophetic movement. Um, this seems like a losing proposition for us to describe the role of the church in the modern world using such terms. Part of the problem is that these terms have been debased and associated with all sorts of unbiblical distortions. So when you think about a priest, maybe the first thing that comes to your mind is priestcraft or late medieval kinds of conceptions of a priest, or even Roman Catholic priests. And that taints our understanding of what the scriptures say about what priests actually do, what their calling is. Not all kings are tyrants, are despots. They're not. Kings can be good. I, um, I was reading... And I don't go into this too much detail, but I was reading it on vacation this year um, a book on the history of the left, of leftism. And in this book, the author reminded or tried to remind his American audience 
that uh, the right, okay, the conservatives, have not always been opposed to monarchy. That monarchy, especially constitutional monarchy, can be much, much, much better than pure democracy. We're getting a little bit of a taste of that these days about what pure democracy brings you. Um, so kings are not all tyrants and despots, and, and royalty is not just universally condemned in the scriptures. There's a, there's a way to be a king. There's a way to be royal, to act royally, which is good. Prophesying does not primarily mean predicting the future. So that as we'll see when I say the church has a prophetic role, we're not just talking about predicting the future. The church has done way too much of that in the last 150 years and been desperately wrong about the imminent coming of Jesus and all that kind of stuff. Prophecy is not even just about, um, you know, picking up a sign and going on the street corner and, and yelling uh, about uh, whatever particular sins the, the city or the culture is involved in. It's, it's not that either. There, there are dimensions to these biblical terms that get submerged under all of the misunderstandings that we, that we, we constantly have to deal with. Um, and it's especially important for us to understand them in their Old Testament context or in their, the context of the Hebrew Scriptures. We clear away a good bit of the debris and we can appreciate what these duties are and how they apply to the church. So, okay, yeah, they're, they're archaic terms, but they're biblical terms, okay? And yeah, maybe modern people won't immediately resonate them, with them, but you can explain it to them, and then they can get it. The other question we have, or even objection, is that, wait, hey, wait a minute. These roles, these offices, are Jesus' offices, not the church. Okay, you know your Westminster Confession of, are you, you know your Westminster Shorter Catechism, number 23, what offices does Christ execute as our Redeemer? Christ as our Redeemer executes the office, offices of prophet, priest, and king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation. Okay. Christ, as the anointed one, is a faithful human, the new Adam. At his baptism, he's anointed, and he's anointed to be king and to rule, and he's anointed to be priest and to serve and to guard, and he also matures into a prophet. We'll talk a little bit about that again as a little later. The same can be said for Abraham and for Moses and for Israel. Abraham begins as a priest, matures into ruling, and then finally matures into a prophet. The first reference to the word prophet in the Bible is Genesis 20, and it's a reference to Abraham. And it's also a surprising reference because when we look at what Abraham's doing as a prophet, it's not exactly what we're used to thinking. Moses, Israel as a whole, starts off in a priestly mode moves into a kingly mode, and then finally ends with a prophetic way of life. Okay? So, so Jesus' work, and, then, and, and, and as I'll show you in a little bit, the book of Acts, the church, starts off with a priestly duty and performs it, and then gets a royal duty and performs it. And then finally, especially through the ministry of Paul, ends up being prophetic in the, in the Roman world. Okay. So I guess what I want to say is Jesus' work is not only performed on our behalf to redeem us, but also as a model for us, a model of faithful human living. Of course, there are unique aspects to what Jesus did. His priestly work is in some ways unique and unrepeatable. He brought us to God the Father in a way that no one else can do, offering the gift of his sinless humanity on the cross. Okay? And yet he made us also to be priests. Jesus' royal vocation is a fulfillment of all the promises from Adam to David. 
He sits on the throne and rules the world as the Son of God, which is a royal title right now. But we also are seated with him in heavenly places and rule with him. And that's found in many places in the New Testament. Okay. And Jesus is the last great prophet of Israel. His advice and counsel to the Father is listened to, and the Father acts on it. His words bring judgment and deliverance. His words are powerful to change lives and transform human history. Okay, That's what prophets do. But he also gives us a place in the heavenly council so that our prayers and petitions are heard by the Father and bring judgment and salvation to the world. Okay. So Jesus as priest, king, and prophet is not only our Redeemer, and that he performed those duties so that we might be delivered and rescued, saved, but he's also a model. So the church, united to Jesus, lives out Jesus. Uh, I mean, just think about it. Jesus is the head. We're the body. And so we, we end up doing uh, these works, these acts, this, uh, this activity, priestly, royal, and prophetic, um, as Jesus empowers us by the Spirit. Okay. That's, that's what's going on. Okay. Okay. Um, that's just kind of an introduction to where I'm going, uh, and I want to pass out something now. And so, Steve, would you help me? Mm -hmm. I want to pass out two, <coughs> two documents here. Okay. Okay. Um, and I w I, I, I'm not going to be able in any way to explain all of this. <laughs> uh, I can only barely scratch the surface, but I do want to talk in general about these things. We don't have a whiteboard up here, huh? I travel all this way, and all I want is a whiteboard. All right, while that's being passed out, um, you just have to you just have to picture this. Okay. What, I want you to, what I want you to picture in your mind, remember, is the basic outline of the history of Israel. Okay. Most of you, most of you know enough of this. I'm not going to confuse you with a lot of details. Just ignore the details on, this, on these sheets right now. Israel starts off as a nation, think about that, on Mount Sinai, as a, as a society of priests. And the priestly calling of Israel is emphasized in the Mosaic period. Think about this. All the, all the sacrifices, the book of Leviticus is given, all the, all the laws, the, all the laws about cleanness, all the laws about food, all the laws about clothing, all the laws about the tabernacle and how to build it and the <laughs> altar and what animals you can bring and what the priest should wear and how the priest should... All this, all this priestly instruction in the Mosaic period, right? All right there, there's, no, there's no reason to stretch anything. Everybody can see that. And then, then with... Uh, with Samuel and then Saul and David, there's a transition, and you move into a period where the emphasis is on Israel as kings, right? Priest, kingdom, a priestly company of tribes to a kingdom ruled by Saul and David and Solomon and the, the rest of the kings, right? Then, after that, kind of merging out of the, uh, the kingly period, you get into another era of Israel's history, and that is after the exile. Northern Israel exiled, and then southern Israel exiled. And then you have all this emphasis on prophets. 
you have Daniel, you have Ezekiel. And, and you, all you got to do is look at your Hebrew Bible or what, what we call the Old Testament to see that you got, first of all, all this priestly instruction. In the middle, you have all this kingly stuff and wisdom, primarily, wisdom literature. And then you have all these prophetic books, okay, prophets. That's the flow of Israel's, Israel's life. That's the sequence of her maturity. She goes from priest to kings to prophets. Now, that sequence, is, it's not as if you stop being priests and then you're only kings and you stop being kings and you're only prophets. The priestly continues and the kingly largely continues, although uh, after the exile there's no kings. They just they rule, but they don't rule in the same way. But the, the challenge then is to, is to say, okay, what was God doing here? What, what is he teaching us? And if you look at the distinctives of each of these periods, you will see that in the priestly period, in the Mosaic time, and now, now I'll have you just look at the, uh, the lecture notes, the one, the, not the Acts one, but the other one the, in biblical theology and human development. You have an emphasis, and I'll read through these quickly, and I, th I hope you can connect with this. Everything in the Mosaic period, in the priestly age, is about the sanctuary, and about priests, and about holiness, and about who can come in, and when they can come in, and how they can come in, how they can approach. God is there. Now, the priests are there to give the proper protocols about how to come in. And that's what priests do. They serve God's house, his sanctuary, and they guard, they guard things. Okay? They guard the holiness of God. And the priests have very simple instructions. Now, we don't think it's simple because it looks complicated to us because we don't live in that era and we don't have a tabernacle and we don't do animal sacrifices, but it's really not that hard. And they have explicit instructions on what they're supposed to do. You can offer this kind of animal and not this kind. And once you get the animal, this is what you do. Then you do this. Then you do that. Then you do that. And then it's over. Very, very, uh, very straightforward, I guess I should say. Not necessarily simple in the sense of, of uh, not, non, not complex, but just, just straightforward. Okay? And you have a lot of law, a lot of instruction. Okay? And, um, and that's... That's what priests do. Priests are, and, and Peter Lighthart's taught us in his Priesthood of the Plebs and his work on this, that priests are basically household servants. God's household has to be served. Okay? Um, you watch Downton Abbey. You have a lot of, the servants there are fascinating to watch. They're the priests of the house. They're the Lord of the manor has priests. Carson and the others. You all watch Downton Abbey, right? Yeah, uh, yeah of course. Uh, they're all priests. And they, they cook, and they clean, and they guard who comes in and who comes out. They take care of the Lord of the manor's house. Well, Yahweh is the Lord of his house. And the priests are those butlers and butchers and footmen and... Um, and they, they perform all these duties so that people will be able to come in and out of this house in a way that's appropriate to the Lord of the house. That's what priests do. Okay? Um, and, and so for the first 500 years of Israel's existence, from the Exodus to about 500 years to the time of Saul, um, their charge was to be faithfully obedient in the sacrifices, in the care of the temple. And that's what falls apart at the end. Everything falls apart at the end because they've been unfaithful and all that, right? Uh, if you look down the column to human development there, you will see that this corresponds basically to uh, childhood. Okay? And... Children are obedient, they're instructed, they're 
their instructions are fairly straightforward. Okay, Their sins are usually just simple disobedience and a failure to obey the father or the mother. Okay, um, And that's a very priestly kind, kind of uh, kind of duty. Um, it's interesting also to note that kids, uh, children, uh, perform a priestly function even in the household. You, can, you might think about how and develop this a little more, but you know, kids often guard the household. Kids often take care of the house, clean it, answer the front door. Um, and do all these things for mom and dad that, that kind of maintains the household. And in doing that, they learn, they grow, uh, but they're basically just doing what mom and dad tell them to do. This is who you let in. This is who you call if you see someone at the front door. You know, all these kinds of things. Um, that's a very priestly, priestly function. Now, Israel then moves on from there and matures into being kings. Okay. Um, now, unfortunately, they want, to be, they want to have a king like all the other nations, and God wants them to have a distinctive kind of king, uh, and so it takes some time for that to happen. But what happens with the king is now you have ruling going on, particularly they're acting, they're, they're bringing people together, they're, they're engaging, they're fighting, they're warriors. David and Saul and David in particular. And what's required is not just simple obedience, but now the obedience is not easy, and it's convoluted, and it doesn't appear, um, it doesn't appear right on the surface what you're supposed to do. You have to think through things. You have to puzz puzzle through things. And so you have all the wisdom literature. And what you thought as a child that, well, if you obey God, he's going to bless you. Okay? Obey God, he blesses you. Disobey God, he curses you. Deuteronomy 28. Pretty simple. Now, all of a sudden, you find out, well, sometimes when you obey God, you suffer. Well, why is that? So you got the book of Job. Job is a ruler. Job is a king. He has advisors. And advisors are not advising him very well. And so you have all this, all this interaction there about wisdom, wisdom literature. You have Proverbs. The son's now grown up and he's gone, gotten out into the world. And you've got two problems, gangs and girls. All right? What, what are you going to do? Now he's got to make these wise choices. He's got to listen to lady wisdom. And lady wisdom is the company of the wise. Got to listen to them. But it's not easy now. Now you've grown up and you're a son. And you have authority. Um, and what is the king supposed to do? The king is supposed to serve and love his people. You get the Song of Songs. And the Song of Songs is a kingly work. It's about Solomon and his people. And his people are his bride. He has a passion for them. That's what the Song of Songs is about. It's about the king's passion for his people. Yes, it's couched in marital imagery. Yes, it means that Sex within marriage is good and, and enjoyable. That's all true, but that's not the point in Song of Songs. The point is to show that there ought to be a passionate connection between a ruler and his people. There ought to be love. Okay? Um, and that's what's going on in the kingly age. Now, once, once the kings fail, and they don't love, but they kill, you know, Manasseh shed, shed so much blood that it... It filled the streets of Jerusalem, and God then had to, had to judge them all. Instead of loving, he's a murderer. Okay? Um, you know, the problem in the priestly age was idolatry, literal idolatry. Okay? The problem in the kingly age is brother-brother hatred. The big problem in the kingly age is you have a split between the two tribes in the south and the two tribes in the north. You have... You have you have uh, hatred between brothers, uh, and that's, that's a problem. And then you also have liturgical idolatry, which is not worshiping a false god, but worshiping the true god in, in a wrong way. Um, once that breaks down, then you move, once that breaks down and God takes them through a death and resurrection process and they, get, they become too more mature, they go into the prophetic age. And when you're prophets, you're in the world. 
Okay, so the, Israel now is no longer in their own land. They're not just in the sanctuary. They're not just in the land. Now they're in the world and they're under world emperors. And their job now is to advise and instruct these world emperors. So Daniel is a key example. Daniel is put in the court of Nebuchadnezzar so that he might advise him and instruct him how he's to live, how he's to rule the kingdom. The same with Mordecai and Esther. Mordecai fails at this. Esther ultimately <coughs> succeeds. Okay. This, is, this is the situation in which Israel finds itself in the first century. She is supposed to be a positive, helpful guide to the Roman Empire. To tell them about law and order and justice. You know, the Romans learned that from the Hebrews. And the Hebrews always had a place in the court of Rome. If you read Roman history, you'll see that the Herods, for example, grew up, most of them, in the court of the emperor in Rome. A lot of, a lot, and, the, and the Romans did that. They brought in Jews and they trained them and they also listened to them. By the time you get to the first century, however, the, um, the Jews have abandoned that, uh, that duty and now they're the source of disorder and riots and lawlessness and sedition and insurrection and rebellion in the in the uh, Roman world. That's ultimately why they're destroyed in AD 70s because they rebelled against their prophetic um, prophetic uh, calling. So um, so that's that's the progression of prophet, priest, of priest, king, and prophet in the old world. Let me just summarize this for you, and I'm going to go into some detail in the next three lectures on priests, kings, and prophets, and then incorporate that into our understanding of the church and what that means for us. So priests are household servants, the Lord's household servants. Okay, they guard. The house, they open and shut to people. They organize people for corporate worship. They serve at the Lord's table, his altar, which means they help others come into the house and meet with the Lord of the house. Meet and eat. Draw near and eat. Okay. They help others meet with God. That's basic. If the church is now a priesthood, and we are the servants of God's house and the place where he chooses to draw near to us. And we help people approach God. We come alongside of people and assist them as they meet with him, as they meet and eat with him. Kings are servants of the land or servants of the larger community. Kings are called to shepherd people, to shepherd and love people. Of course, all this language comes into four, especially with David, the shepherd king. Okay? And their vocation requires obedience, of course, but also wisdom and discernment. And kings compose poetry and hymns and songs and make, invent musical instruments and administer justice for all, especially for the weak. And kings die for their people, their service is a form of self-denial and self-effacing love. And the supreme form of wise, loving living is self-denial and love. When kings fail, they murder and king. They, they murder and kill. They don't feed the sheep, they slaughter the sheep. The greatest example of this is in Mark 6 and the difference between Herod and Jesus. Herod is a wolf king. He devours the choicest of the sheep. John the Baptist is brought to him on a platter to eat. Jesus is a shepherd king. He makes people sit on the green grass and feeds them. Okay. Okay. So um, when kings fail, they become despotic and worse murderers. Uh, they become wolves. Okay. Solomon fails in this way. The Herods fail in this way in the Gospels. The rulers of Israel are killing Jesus. Okay. 
and, and then killing Jesus' disciples. And the church in Acts slowly takes the place of these rulers, shepherding people, providing them food, and serving them well. Prophets, <clears throat> lastly here, just our summary, prophets have an even more exalted call. <laughs> prophets are not simply heavenly UPS carriers who mindlessly deliver messages. Okay. Prophets are not just prognosticators about the future. Prophets are God's chief counselors. He brings them into his counsel and consults them before he acts. Prophets petition God to change the world, and he listens to them. And we'll talk about that more next week, ne uh, tomorrow, next week. I'm not going to be here for a week. You don't, you don't want that. Um, and their, and their, words, their words are powerful. And so the prophetic calling of the church is a fulfillment of this. We are God's friends and advisors. Our formal prayer in church is to petition God to bring judgment on the world and therefore deliverance. And then, of course, we're sent out into the world to advise people about justice and law and order and wisdom and love and service so that wherever we serve, whatever vocation we're in, we can be a, a good influence, both by example and by words, to transform and change the world. That's, that's what prophets do. Uh, the last thing I'll say here is on, in this, this particular um, prophet, priest, king, and acts, this handout, it, it's fascinating to note this. And you reflect upon this a little bit. I'll, I'll bring out how... Acts 13 makes this transition. But if you notice here, what happens in the book of Acts is the first five chapters are in Jerusalem. And many priests come to the faith. And then in chapter 6, all of a sudden, there's a question about how the widows are going to be fed and served well. And so what happens is in, in their wisdom, the apostles appoint men full of the spirit to oversee the distribution to these widows. That's a very kingly act. That's a royal act. And then in, in, from Acts 6 to Acts 12, you're in the land of Israel, and there are all these kind of things that are happening that are related to kings, like the eunuch from Ethiopia in Acts 8 who comes up and then is converted. And then finally, at the end of Acts, this, this section in Acts 12, um, Herod Agrippa II dies. Okay. Um, all, these, all these kind of kingly references. And also in, this, in that particular period of time, the whole point is bringing Jew and Gentile together, Cornelius and Peter. And then the struggle with, well, are Jews and Gentiles really going to be united in this church, is this brother-brother relationship going to be one of union or one of separation? It's all about love and service. Then in chapter 13, the beginning of chapter 13, you had the beginning of the mission of Paul, and all the elders in Antioch get together and they decide that they're going to send out Barnabas and, and, and Saul to, to the mission field. And there are a bunch of prophets there. And they prophesy this, and they lay hands on, on, on Saul. And Saul and Barnabas go to Cyprus. And it, it is fascinating, I think, and I hope to show you this uh, in the third lecture tomorrow, how Saul and Barnabas then take over the work that Israel was supposed to do with regard to the Roman rulers and provide wise and um, productive advice for them. They leave behind churches in the, whole, in the whole of the Roman world, churches and Christians that will be a source of instruction on what is good and right and what is helpful, what is how to rule. Uh, the Jews have become the, a source of sedition and hatred and riots. It's fascinating what the book of Acts does in those last chapters, how in the end, the Jews are so bad, all they want to do is assassinate Paul. 
<laughs> they take a vow to assassinate him. And Paul is so moved by love and concern for the Romans that he wants to present the gospel to them. He wants to bring them life and ultimately ends up going to Rome. It's, the, the contrast is amazing how Israel fails utterly and is replaced by the church in her prophetic role. Okay, so I'm out of time. Any questions? Time for questions? Is that all right? Any questions or comments about that? And my answer is going to be I'll, I'll talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> now, hopefully there will be a little more time tomorrow for some, some questions. Okay. I know Steve is, I'm, I know I'm probably going over things that Steve has talked about in the past, but it's good to hear from somebody else. <laughs> All right. Thanks. <laughs>